The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. All the political parties say they want to grow Ontario. It's how they'll do it that differs. Tonight, we focus on two sectors critical to that mission. First, what does post-secondary education need to recover from two plus years of COVID-19 and which party has the best plan? Then, do the platforms have what Ontario's once mighty manufacturing sector needs to win in the 21st century? It's Wednesday, May 18th, and that's next on The Agenda. More nurses, more personal support workers, more skilled trades, more tech experts, more doctors. Ontario's economy needs them all as it comes back from the worst of COVID-19. Do the political parties have plans that will get students and the institutions they attend aligned to educate them all after some very tough times indeed? Let's ask. In Kingston, Ontario, Glenn Volebrecht, president and CEO of St. Lawrence College and the incoming chair at Colleges Ontario. In Peterborough, Ontario, Susan Wirtle, president of OCUFA, the Ontario Confederation of University Faculty Associations. She's a professor of geography at Trent University. In Brampton, Ontario, Craig Fowler, vice president of growth, innovation and external relations at Algoma University, which of course is based in Sault Ste. Marie. And in Ontario's capital city, Mitra Yacoubi, chair of the Canadian Federation of Students, Ontario. And we're delighted to welcome all four of you to our program tonight for a conversation about one of the most important sectors uh, in our province, the post-secondary world. And just to set up our discussion, Sheldon, if you wouldn't mind, bring up this graphic and let's just go through some of the 411 on the post-secondary sector because it accounts for more than $120 billion annually in the province's gross domestic product. The sector employs more than 118,000 people. More than 900,000 students are enrolled in our post-secondary institutions. And more than 180,000 graduate every year with the qualifications required to help grow our economy and one hopes to lead happy, productive lives as citizens as well. Okay, Glenn, get us started here. Beyond those dollar values, what role do colleges and universities play in the Ontario economy? Sure. So, you know, I think uh, colleges and our grads are, are vital to the uh, to uh, a thriving, um, you know, provincial economy and quite frankly to our to our future. You know, if you walk past uh, any construction site, uh, visit a manufacturing facility, get your hair cut, go to go to lunch, uh, or go to any healthcare setting, uh, chances are. Um, you're going to come across a college grad. Um, you know, we're 55 years old now, which uh, incidentally is the last time the Leafs won the cup, but no no coincidence. Oh, man. Um, oh, but, man. Oh, man. Glenn, boy, taking shots sorry, already lifetime, like that. That hurt. Lifetime, lifetime fan. <laughs> but in all seriousness, you know, 55 years, uh, the programs that we've developed over those 55 years, um, the fact of the matter uh, is, is that, um, you know, each and every day, a college graduate is contributing to uh, not only the economy, but uh, to society as a whole. Mitra, are you in the midst of an educational journey in the post-secondary world right now? I am. I'm currently doing my graduate studies at the University of Toronto. How are you finding it? It's very challenging, but it's interesting nonetheless. And you hope to graduate with what? Um, I'm hoping to graduate in Master's in Global Affairs and Public Policy. Wow, okay, that sounds terrific. Um, as you go through the experience of being a post-secondary student and you look around at your fellow students, uh, what, do you, what do you hope and what do you feel you can contribute to this province economically, socially, and every other way uh, as you finish off your educational journey? Well, I think the way I like to think about like my role, but also the roles of um, colleges and universities is that like they are home to the most valuable asset to our society. So the students like myself, uh, we know that like youth and students are our future and investment in post-secondary is an investment in our future. Um, so recognizing that, you know, the Conference of Board of Canada has calculated that there is for every dollar invested in higher education by the Canadian government, the economic value added to Canadian economy is a dollar thirty-six. So I'm hoping that I can also contribute to that, but also alongside my fellow us, uh, fellow students who are going to contribute not just to the economy but that post-pandemic recovery. Uh, recognizing that you know students right now are already contributing in a variety of different ways because 
you know, students are workers or caregivers or people that rent or people that buy food. You know, we pay taxes, we hold jobs, um, and we contribute to the society in a lot of different ways already, but like hoping to do that even in the future. Um, and just recognizing that there's a different capacity that we can contribute in right now. And if it wasn't for like high tuition fees and, you know, loans after graduation, we could probably also think about investing in housing and, and things like that. So the government needs to invest in us students so that we can continue to invest in Ontario. Okay, you put a bunch of issues on the table that we are going to pursue and others as well. And to that end, uh, Susan, uh, of course, we've invited you and your colleagues to be with us tonight because uh, we want to sort of... Uh, do a bit of crunching, number crunching, uh, et cetera, with the four par major parties' platforms. And why don't we just start by having you tell us, since you represent OCUFA, the Confederation of University Faculty Associations, uh, what the professoriate would like to see in uh, the party platforms that you think would be useful for the province. Sure, thanks. Um, certainly the professoriate needs to see um, more investment in universities. Um, we've seen a dramatic cut over the last uh, several decades, and this is just not sustainable. What we've demonstrated through the pandemic, I think, is that faculty um, and academic librarians, the, the professoriate at um, Ontario's universities can contribute and has to be um, a solid um, driver of the uh, Ontario economy. So we've got um, important research that's going on. We've got the uh, extraordinarily important job of educating our students. Um, and both of those kind of key pieces have to be um, part of our um, pandemic recovery. And so, let me just do a quick uh, follow-up with you here, Susan, and that is, yeah. you know, you, you do what many uh, organizations in the province do, which is you send out a request to the major political parties and say, uh, you know, tell us what you've got on offer so we can compare and then offer some critical analysis. Um, how did that go? Well, we heard from three of the four main parties, and that's disappointing not to have heard from the Conservatives, but... Uh, there are nevertheless things we can tell from the conservative uh, uh, budget, um, you know, the election budget, if you will, what uh, what they're thinking and where they're where they're heading. So, in terms of what we heard, we heard strong support to uh, repeal Bill 124, which is that regressive wage restraint that's really prevented universities and so many other broader public sector employers from addressing um, appalling working conditions. In our case, it's really the contract faculty. Who suffer the most um, under that um, under that bill? Um, they've also uh, demonstrated strong support. The other three um, parties for the creation of full-time, stable, properly funded faculty positions. So whether you're talking about re replacing retiring faculty or whether you're talking about creating new positions, there's a real interest in the university sector, of course. In, creating um, new faculty positions that represent um, our equity goals, that represent our reconciliation goals. These are all things that require um, properly funded, long-term stable um, funding. Um, we also saw some interesting and promising ideas around replacing performance-based funding with grants that are indexed to okay, hold off a weighted that. national you know average. That, that's, that's, yeah. that's technical stuff we're going to get to a little bit later because I think Perfect. nobody understands what that means yet until we give it some explanation. Yeah. So let's, um, uh, let me go to Craig in the meantime. And Craig, as I set up this question for you, let's acknowledge that every post-secondary institution in the province needs to have a good relationship with Queen's Park. So when I ask you to rate how well the current Conservative government has done over the past four years, let's understand that the answer you give um, may be somewhat affected by the fact that you've got to stay on decent terms with these guys in case they win again. Okay, so let's put that out there. How do you think they've done? Well, I do appreciate the caveat because it is something. Um, we're always, look as a sector, looking for a partner at Queen's Park. Um, you know, I, I think looking back on the past four years, there really was first a major shift in policy from what we've seen in the um, over the past, say, 10 or 15 years that we had the relationship with the McGuinty and Wynn government and Liberal government. That's not unexpected in a change. And as a sector, we've experienced many governments throughout our existence and even uh, to a certain extent predating uh, the parties. So adapting to that change has been difficult. Um, some of the, I would say, the combination of uncertainty and change compounded together made it very difficult. So, for example, I think a lot of people are aware of the 10% tuition reduction that was brought in by the current uh, Conservative government. 
that in and of itself was brought in rather quickly. So we, we've had to absorb that in the middle of the budgeting process. And as a sector, you know, we're course loading years out, we're making investments in infrastructure years out, we're working with our faculty years out, we're working with our student population and staff years out. So absorbing a 10% and then in fact, uh, if you add another 3% because there was an ongoing um, tuition increase in one whole year really was difficult. Now, um, others on the panel have also mentioned the reality of uh, multi-year stable funding or just a multi-year framework of funding. That's something that we've been seeking to as a partner with uh, Queens Park. We're always looking to Queens Park as one of our number one partners. And so having a multi-year funding flexibility is really important. So um, there's that element, but then there's the element, and it's really the elephant in the room of the pandemic. So you kind of have to look at, or at least I look at from the sector, there's what the government was doing from policy and programmatic um, changes in the beginning of their mandate to what they were doing during the, the pandemic. And through the pandemic, they have been listening to us uh, as a whole, us as a sector. So we, we are appreciative of that. I think a lot of uh, the policy got pushed to the side. We're seeing um, cues, as others have mentioned, within the recent budget of where we're going. And so... Um, just catching up with that and dealing with the combination of the uncertainty and change is always difficult. All right, Glenn, I want to follow up with you on the uh, tuition freeze situation because, of course, by freezing tuition, the government has essentially frozen potential revenues to your institutions to make them better. And all of this in a world where inflation is running at whatever, five, six, seven percent. So I presume. Well, you tell me, what kind of impact has this had on your ability to deliver a quality education uh, yeah. to all the college and, and in the other cases, university students across the province? No, no, great, you know, great question, and and others have mentioned it as well. And you know, when you when you look at funding, you really have to look at the overall funding model for colleges and 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 universities. And and I have to say, and it it it, it, it irks me if I'm allowed to say if I'm allowed to say that it really irks me when uh, tuition policies um, combine universities and colleges, um, and and that always happens. It's happened my entire career. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at college tuition separately, um, it's a among the lowest in the country um, versus, you know, university education in Ontario is among, is among the highest, but we always get lumped into the same uh, category. And as a result, um, it's, you know, it, it creates all kinds of challenges uh, for, for colleges. So, you know, one of the things that we'd like to see is a separate tuition policy uh, for colleges, one that uh, ensures that government invests in colleges, government invests in students and, and, and continues uh, to make colleges accessible because that's what we're about as a, as a system. But I have to, I have to say, we'd really like to see uh, a separate tuition policy between colleges and universities. Mitra, you're on the university side of things, and I should ask you, you know, if a government, if a party comes into power pledging to freeze tuition for three or four years, you would think students would love that, do they? Well, I think the way that I like to think about tuition freezes is like, without accounting for public funding, it's really going to put um, a burden on international and out-of-province students as institutions are going to scramble to make up for that like loss of revenue in a way freezes are like temporary solutions to a more permanent issue of high tuition fees and lack of publicly funded structure so in reality we need more sustainable solutions like investing in free publicly funded education to increase again access to higher education recognizing that yes the freeze is going to let people that are already in post-secondary education to continue but it doesn't necessarily increase access for folks um, that don't have access to post-secondary education to begin with. Well, I should ask you, the Ford government did put the 10% tuition cut in place in 2019-2020. That supposedly saved students about $450 million a year. Uh, I'm not sure that they put an additional amount of, an equivalent amount of investment into the system to make up for that loss of income. Uh, the tuition freeze, as we say, is now on for the third year in a row. Have, have you been able to see in your daily scholastic life any changes or differences would, would, which would make you conclude, you know what, the system is not quite as good today as it was maybe five years ago because of these changes? Um, I think, yes, the past four years have been really difficult across the board for everyone in Ontario. And like students in post-secondary education were like no different. Like you mentioned, the Student Choice Initiative was implemented as an attack, and it was an attack on students' rights to organize really, right? thinking about the fact that it cut funding for 
a lot of resources and, and services that students make use of in their daily lives, thinking about the fact that those fundings were used for student organizations, food banks on campuses, the school newspapers that were going to be heavily impacted by Student Choice Initiative. So that the Student Choice Initiative was never really about, um, you know, saving students money, but was more about attacking students' rights to organize on their campuses and ultimately impacting those essential services that students make use of. So yeah, the past four years have been very difficult for students and there has been extreme cuts to OSAB and post-secondary education funding. I think it's around a billion dollars um, in the past three years and that's a huge number. Well, let's just talk for a moment here about what the uh, New Democrats have on offer for this election campaign. Uh, they plan to, I guess I should set this up by saying the previous Liberal government had in place a program which essentially offered free tuition uh, for eligible um, college and university students. The NDP would bring that program back. They'd convert loans to grants, retroactively erasing student loan interest, and they'd forgive debt for other students. Uh, okay, Susan, come on in here and tell me what you think of those ideas. Those are all great ideas as long as they come with matching funding for universities because you can't have the continuation of the system that we've had um, at the moment where any cuts to tuition translate directly into lost revenues for universities. So that's the, that's the simple answer. Those are great things. I think that anything that increases the accessibility of students uh, to, to university education is fantastic. Anything that decreases the long-term debt um, of students is is fantastic as well. But if it doesn't come with funding for universities, then it's it's um, never going to actually succeed in achieving the kind of policy goals I think that the government uh, needs to have. All right, let's get the administration side of be. things. Uh, Craig, what do you think of the, what the NDP has on offer? Well, I echo uh, Susan's comment. Um, it's great for students. I come from a relatively uh, small university. We see ourselves as an access university, but I think it's it's fair across the entire province that access and affordability of, for students is really important. Um, but at the same time, we don't live in a bubble. Uh, inflation and, and people really are feeling inflation these days, but even before inflation shot up, um, always is going on. So we're going to have to, as an administration, figure out what balance we're, we're striking and whether that's in efficiencies, whether that's in uh, number class sizes, things like international students. It really is a balancing act with the zero sum game and it becomes exponentially difficult if the zero sum, there's a component taken out of that. Glenn, how about to you? The NDP's offer, what do you think? You know, I, I, you know, agree with agree with the panel. Anything that in, increases access for students, I'm in support of. But you have to look at the overall picture. You know, um, colleges. Uh, the the Auditor General in, in uh, December, I think, released a report that said, you know, the financial sustainability of colleges in the future is risky. Um, and so we need to look at the overall base funding metal, uh, uh, model for 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 colleges. You know, Mitra talked about the fact that um, you know it's not an expense investing in post secondary education it's an investment and for every dollar the government puts in uh, to post-secondary education and we've had the studies uh, that have been done I think you get 14 or 15 dollars back on that now I don't know about you but that's a pretty good investment uh, for for government it's a great investment for students so I think we need to look at you know the overall picture and 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 from a government perspective uh, and where they want uh, the higher education system to be in the future you know we're we're fortunate we have probably uh, you know one of the best uh, higher education systems in, in the world, um, but we got to continue to invest in it. All right, let's see what the Liberals have up their sleeves. They would plan to double the Student Assistant Plan funding, OSAP funding. They'd provide more grants. They'd eliminate interest on provincial student loans, uh, forgive all loans for frontline health care workers, and provide free tuition for early childhood education college programs uh, because they see a significant need to get significantly higher numbers of people into those areas. Uh, okay, let's start us off. Uh, Susan, why don't you uh, take a first kick at that one? How do you like or not like what uh, the Liberals have on offer? Well, again, I mean, some of the comments that, you know, I made and the other panelists made um, apply to apply to this piece as well, uh, which is that if you don't, uh, you know, if you, if you bring in student um, uh, uh, pr processes to support students, it has to, it has to be fully funded at the university level. I think, um, you know, generally the idea of re reduced uh, tuition for particular programs makes a lot of sense, but it, the devil's always in the details. And so, you know, some of the initiatives that I've seen 
described talk about um, you know tying that funding to serving in certain uh, low service areas um, of the province. If that's the kind of thing, again, that might be great. But maybe what we actually need is solid funding for northern universities, solid funding for uh, university francophone universities. So we you gotta you gotta dig in. I think to to the details um, to see what uh, what that really means. Okay, curious about the uh, the uh, uh, commitment to bring back. Uh, essentially free, I think is the way they described it, essentially free post-secondary education for eligible students. Craig, is that a good idea? Well, it, it builds on what we were uh, discussing too, or I mentioned with respect to the NDP platform. Anything that provides access is great. We come from a community, especially we look at our campus, um, not just in Sault Ste. Marie and Timmins, but even our students coming to our Brampton campus, access and affordability is really important. And um, even though we're in, and I'm sitting right now in the middle of the downtown of Brampton, uh, people assume there's a very affluent, lots of money, lots of activities. A lot of first generation students and households don't have the funding. So it, it's great. Um, it, and it, it really does though come with um, how that how that plays out with respect to the tuition and the, the grants per students coming from Queen's Park to the institution, whether it's a college or a university. Um, so very supportive of, from an access point of view and an affordability point of view, but always interested in kind of the details and the fine print. The one thing too, I'll, I'll just mention that uh, wasn't brought up that you may not see as important to the sector that the Liberals did uh, commit to. It's, it's actually on their $5 million, $500 million retrofit uh, building retrofit. So there's a lot of deferred maintenance issues within our sector, um, you know, the college, the university sector predating the college sector, but even at 55 years old, there are buildings across all post-secondary in Ontario that really do need retrofit. And as we do the deferred maintenance and as we do those things that aren't really as exciting, it's taking money away from uh, frontline teaching, frontline student supports and uh, bursaries. So it's, it's an important one that uh, other parties didn't mention. Mitra, I have heard some politicians in the past argue that the equivalent of, say, graduating from high school 25 or 50 years ago today is having a BA or having a, you know, having that first university degree. You can't really get a very good, this is the argument, you can't get a great job in society unless you get that first college or university degree. And their argument, therefore, is because it's so essential, it ought to be free for everybody. Are you making that argument? Post-secondary education is absolutely very important today in, in our society. Like you mentioned, it is necessary for a lot of skills um, that are necessary to continue to get those jobs and contribute to the economy, like you mentioned in the earlier discussion. So I definitely do think that universities and colleges play an important role. And, and we need free education to make it accessible for students who are interested and being in post-secondary education to have access without thinking about the financial burden of being in post-secondary, but also recognizing that we need to invest in publicly funded structures to make it accessible for, for students and, and for institutions to have free education for all. Okay. I now want to, uh, Susan, come back to you because you raised this issue earlier and it's important and we got to try and explain it to people so that they understand it because the Ford government has tried to implement plans for a new funding formula for post-secondary uh, institutions called the performance-based funding model. Let's start by just explaining what that means. I, I will do my best. Um, it is a funding model that stipulates that a portion of post-secondary, of, of an institution's funding is determined based on how that institution measures up to certain performance targets. So it includes, um, for ex uh, example, things like uh, graduate employment rates, um, uh, graduate earnings, uh, level of um, experiential learning, for example. And the idea is that this would be a phased in piece. It was paused during the pandemic, thankfully. Uh, but the idea is that this would be a phased in thing and under the pro, uh, progressive conservatives the plan is that it would eventually constitute 60 percent of the funding for um, universities which is the, the sector that i'm most familiar with and is this it's, to suggest that the, the better you do the more money your institution gets it's that kind of incentive it is that kind of incentive yeah. okay what do we think of that what do we think of it? We think that it's poorly designed. We think that it's uh, unnecessarily time consuming. We think that it will 
undoubtedly lead to gaming the system where the primary goal will become to meet the metric rather than deliver on quality education. Um, we're not against tracking data and measuring our work, but tying it to um, tying the funding to the metrics means that we will undermine long-term planning. We will undermine institutions that need the support or funding the most. If you're struggling, you're not going to get this funding. Um, and fundamentally, it contributes to a competitive system rather than a collaborative system. And that applies between universities. It also be, uh, applies between universities and the college sector. So on all kinds of different levels, we think it's um, a really bad plan. Craig, you're on the administrative side of things. What do you think about this performance-based funding model that the Ontario current Ontario government would like to advance? Well, it just uh, technically... It the genesis really was in 2012 under um, beginning the McGuinty government and then the Liberal government in the Drummond Commission. It was one of the recommendations that post-secondary institutions should have bilateral agreements with uh, the government and was something that uh, the government at the time uptook. Now, as you've noted, they've evolved and it's evolved quite substantially into getting to a point where 60% of funding is part of that pot now, which is obviously a large percentage. Um, from an administrative point of view, it really is a difficult thing. So building on what, what Susan mentioned, it does potentially have some um, negative impacts, some unintended consequences that I would challenge that even the current government did does not attend, the competitiveness, um, the way we work within a community. Because some of the metrics really are dependent on what community that institution's located in. So it's one thing to be in a community with a low unemployment rate, uh, growing economy, uh, innovative economy, so uptakes of jobs uh, post graduation, very easy to map. Where you know I, we have campuses all throughout Northern Ontario, it's a little more difficult. And treating it all the same is um, is very difficult for the administration to look at and to think about what we want to be. Um, as we grow forward. Our university also has a special mission, the special missions associated with our um, founding of our, our institution really does tie into our Indigenous roots. And so that's something that we take very uh, serious and it's not something that's accounted for. So it's a very long way of saying, um, much like Susan, not against being judged, not against being evaluated, not against uh, having metrics and KPIs to, uh, performance indicators, but really understanding how they play and giving some flexibility for the institutions and the region to really have the broader goals achieved of the system and of the local community. Okay, Glenn, what do the colleges of this province think about it? Well, you know, again, you know, as others have said, it's an accountability framework, and, and we've never shied away from that as a system. And, you know, in fact, prior to this, we had key performance indicators or KPIs that measured, you know, gradu graduate employment, employer satisfaction, those types of things. And, and we've always, you know, scored very, very well on that. I think it comes back down again to what is that base funding amount, right? To be, you know, colleges need to be able to know what our base funding is. And if you look at base funding today versus maybe, uh, a decade ago, it's gone down in real dollars about 20%, um, and 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 that's difficult to to you know to create programs that are really going to generate um, and help Ontario's economy in the future in terms of you know robotics and AI and and data type programs uh, if we don't have a stable uh, a stable uh, funding unit. But you know in terms of uh, measuring performance, we no, none of us have shied away from that. Um, we thrive in in that environment, and we're proud of uh, we're proud of uh, the statistics that we provide and, and the edu quality education that we provide our students. Okay. We've got a few minutes left here, and Mitra, I want to bring you in on this because, well, we've done a number of programs in the last couple of years about what the educational experience has been like, both for colleges and universities, uh, f for students who really have paid the full freight and the regular tuition and have really not got, well, for example, what I in my day would have had, which was a normal education. You guys have dealt with COVID. And you've been doing online classes instead of real classes. And a lot of the extracurriculars were canceled. And, you know, we, we know what the, chest, what the checklist looks like of everything that so many students have missed over the last couple of years. To that end, Mitra, I want to know whether you see reflected in the plans that all four major parties have an understanding of what's been lost and what they plan to do to make it up to you guys. I would say no because across the platforms, there isn't really 
a focus on students. There isn't a vision for post-secondary education. Students haven't been prioritized in the way that they need to be. Uh, youth and students make up a major like voting block, but they haven't really been thought about. Um, so I think no, and there's a lot of like experiences that have been neglected when it comes to, like you said, students went through a pandemic and they still had to be students and workers and you know caregivers and do the things that they need to do to function as society. So um, I'm really hoping that they recognize that students have a multitude of lived experiences and they've been impacted by the pandemic and we need a recovery that includes all students that is just right. And that includes going through, again, publicly funded structures, making sure that uh, we're respecting students' rights to organize on campuses so that they can continue to get access to those services and advocacy and events that make up their experiences on campus that is so valuable to the campus life that they experience uh, pre-pandemic. But we can't do that if we don't protect um, the students' rights to organize, but we also ensure like free and accessible education so that they don't have to think about um, being in post-secondary um, and, and making ends meet. Okay, I think it makes sense when we're doing a program about post-secondary education to give the student the last word on this one. So that's what we're going to do. I want to thank all four of you for appearing on TVO tonight and sharing your views during this 43rd general election campaign. Many thanks, everybody. Great, thank you. Thank you. Rarely has talk about supply chains and industrial capacity been the stuff of dinner table conversations as it has been over the past two years. But as COVID has in so many ways, it's prompted reconsideration of how we've been doing things. And in the case of manufacturing, it's reminded everyone why making things in Ontario is never a bad thing. That's all put some key issues on the election agenda. With us for more in the Greenboro neighborhood of our nation's capital, economic sociologist Alini Coutinho, a postdoctoral fellow at the Smart Prosperity Institute and sessional lecturer at the University of Ottawa. And in the provincial capital, there's Dennis Darby. He's president and CEO of Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. And we're delighted to welcome both of you to our program for a really important topic and something I suspect we need to put more focus on because, Dennis, you're going to start us off by telling us how important manufacturing is to the economic base and future of our province. Go ahead. Well, th thank you, Steve. And you're right. It, it still represents, people talk about manufacturing or post-manufacturing, but not the case in Ontario. It's about $300 billion a year. It's about 11% of our GDP, and it employs about 780,000 workers across Ontario. And uh, aside from a little dip at the start of the pandemic, it's almost completely recovered to those levels. So it's an incredibly important part of the economy. It's about 80% of our exports, most of which go to the U.S. Now, you said 11% of our gross domestic product here in the province. Is that number rising or declining? It, it has been more or less flat for the last few years, uh, more because other sectors have grown faster. But from a dollar point of view, in 2019, we hit an all-time record uh, amount of, of manufacturing sales. So it's it's kind of held its own. Okay. Alini, for those people who are perhaps new to our province and who, um, who don't know, let's go through a bit of a checklist right here. What are the key manufacturing industries in the province of Ontario that we rely on so much? Yeah, the manufacturing in Ontario has changed tremendously in the past 30 years. Currently, we continue being a uh, powerhouse in automotive manufacturing, auto parts. Uh, we're pretty good as well in biotech, pharmaceuticals, chemicals. Uh, these are um, durable goods manufacturing are what we are really uh, good at. And why do you think these companies, you know, I guess I'm asking, what's the Ontario advantage? Why do they want to be here? Well, Ontario has a tradition in, um, you know, automotive uh, sector. We are really good places to attract um, clean tech you know, workforce. We have a good infrastructure for that. We are very close to um, our neighbors in the South, in the United States, very integrated markets. Uh, it's very easy to, you know, uh, move goods across uh, across borders. So we are very good strategically well positioned to um, to be at the forefront of manufacturing North America. 
Now, having said that, Dennis, anybody who has lived here for a while will well remember that over the past couple of recessions, uh, the manufacturing sector in particular has been hit really hard, and we did shed a lot of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs, over a period of time. What would you say are the most pressing challenges, therefore, facing manufacturing in the province today? Well, I think the, the biggest challenge today in the current is the, the shortage of labor. In fact, uh, you know, as Lini said, we are we have a great workforce, but it, we haven't been able to get as many people into Ontario to support, you know, this sector, which, you know, includes, I want to just make one thing, food processing alone is $46 billion. So it's another big part of the, of the manufacturing we do in Ontario. And so we need people. That's been the number one issue. Uh, whether it's training and retraining, but really getting more people in Ontario, because there are up somewhere around 30 to 35,000 unfilled jobs. So despite the discussion about recessions, we really could hire anyone who's available right now in Ontario. So in your judgment, is that a cry out for more immigration or for more people graduating from our post-secondary institutions to fill those roles? Both. Of course, we need more. We had about a year, a year and a half, where we really didn't have that influx of net uh, immigration of skilled workers and, and and that we needed and you're right we really have to get more people women girls you know, newcomers to go into the manufacturing uh, sector I mean it, I, again it's really important for us to be able to have that workforce of the future and you know I was just talking the other day on this program about uh, the mining sector and the fact that, you know, that, that many people will have an impression of somebody on their hands and knees with a pickaxe hammering against a wall and uh, that's not, those aren't the skills you need to be a miner anymore. You've got to know how to run computers. You've got to know big tech, et cetera, et cetera. So, Alini, uh, let me get you to respond to the same question. The most pressing challenges, in your judgment, facing the manufacturing sector today are what? That is it. I agree. I totally agree. It's a skilled labor force. Um, and factory sector has changed tremendously. We have upgraded our industries. It has been automated. Uh, we really need those high-skilled tradespeople's working on um, in manufacturing. The thing is, uh, our population is aging as well. So we are losing uh, that skills, that pool of skilled workers as well. So yes, um, immigration is a way to circumvent, but also uh, investing in uh, the population that is already here as well, ensuring that we have equity-seeking groups, expanding the opportunities for them to fully participate uh, and enter the manufacturing uh, sector as well. Another uh, issue aside the workforce and skill shortages uh, that we are facing is access to capital access to capital. A lot of manufacturing um, firms, they are small firms, they are medium small firms. Uh, they have encountered difficulties, especially in the clean tech sector, uh, encountered difficulties in accessing that uh, capital for scale up, startups, etc. So that's another issue that uh, a challenge that must be addressed. Gotcha. Let me uh, invite the two of you just to get comfortable for a moment, because I want to take a moment here just to go through the four major parties' platforms and what they have on offer as it relates to manufacturing. So we'll put some graphics up describing that. For those of you listening on podcast right now, I'll, I'll read out some of these bullet points so you can get a sense of what's on offer. This is in order of precedence in the last house. And here are some of the pledges related to manufacturing from the PCs, who have pledged $685 million bucks to Ford, GM, and Honda to support electric vehicles and EV hybrid model manufacturing, another $107 million over three years towards critical technologies, and they've committed a billion dollars for developing infrastructure such as an all-season road uh, to the Ring of Fire in northwestern Ontario. Let's move on to the NDP. The New Democrats are promising that 100% of vehicle sales in the province will need to be zero emission by the year 2035. As part of their labor force strategy, the NDP say they will work with manufacturers to fill vacancies and provide appropriate training. You were just talking, Dennis, about that. They plan to introduce a new cap-and-trade program as well. On to the Liberals, who plan to reinvest from a strengthened carbon pricing plan to advance clean tech and create jobs. They intend to create a North American Battery Alliance. Their platform includes $9 billion in investment over four years into a clean economy plan, which they say would create 25,000 new green jobs. 
And speaking of Greens, here's what the Greens have on offer. They're pledging to implement a comprehensive EV manufacturing and transportation strategy. Over four years, they're talking about a $5 billion investment to EV mobility and green tech innovation and another $4 billion into their so-called climate bank. Okay, that's a lot to digest, so let's take some time here and go through this. Uh, Dennis, you've seen it. What, we're going to go through sort of what you like and what you don't like. So start off with what you like. So I think it's, it's an interesting, this is one of those times when most of the parties uh, are committed to uh, about the same thing, which is really how to help transform this industry. So, so those capital investments uh, are so critical because they, they support the whole supply chain. So those commitments to capital investment, and, and really I, I, when you use the word green tech or, or clean tech, all manufacturing need to move to that clean tech. I need to adopt the technologies to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions to, to be more fuel efficient in how they manufacture products. So I think from the, I think the conservative government has made, you know, has, has made some uh, choices and I think they really are quite, quite broad scale. And it really builds on that transportation uh, and machine building uh, hi history of this province. Um, no real quibbles with any of the, the, the of the parties. I think training is really important. How you get there, how you get that training, whether it's tax credits uh, at the at the employer level, especially for SMEs, or it's more a more broad uh, cha you know adjustments to the colleges. I think we're all we're all going in the same direction. Okay, Alini, what jumped out at you as being something you think is really useful among the party platforms? I agree. I agree that there is a certain similarity across uh, all these platforms, uh, and they're all locating discussions about uh, manufacturing within this broader transition to achieve or to achieve our uh, net zero goals, right? So decarbonizing the economy, decarbonizing manufacturing, uh, which is great. Um, what I really like is uh, these conversations, they do uh, talk and they address uh, those those shortages, those, those challenges that we have just identified not long ago in terms of skills, um, you know, increasing the pool of workers and uh, investments, access to investment. Uh, one thing that I feel that is lacking is a broader conversation about, uh, as, as our, my colleague here has just identified, um, how are we going to do that? How are we going to train those? How are you going to uh, um, create those opportunities for for people, for workers to to uh, firms to not only attract workers, but retain those workers, especially workers from equity deserving groups. Uh, how are we going to achieve that? Um, so I feel that there is there needs to be a broader conversation about manufacturing, not as an isolated sector in our economy, but uh, in communication with other sectors as well, high education, other partners, other stakeholders, uh, other sectors of the economy. How can we together collaborate and ensuring that manufacturing remains a powerhouse in Ontario's economy? Dennis, do you have a view in terms of responding to the concern Alini just raised there? Yeah, I think I think what we're speaking about here is that you know the, where high tech goes to produce GDP is in manufacturing. So the so you're right. We have to first of all incentivize employers. You know when they make new hires to to help them train and develop those employees. If there's data from from Europe and countries like Germany and and Italy and France where they they do that does drive some loyalty. So number one, you if you train them. And, and provide that at, at that career advancement and the knowledge build, you'll, you'll keep them. Number two, we need to make sure, and this is good, this is actually we're having a provincial discussion today, Steve, because normally at, at the federal level, the federal government can just sort of throw money to the provinces and, and how they spend it, you know, is up to them and it's hard to coordinate. Here's where Ontario can actually be in the lead and say, okay, we're going to help bring more STEM graduates in. We're going to help get more of them, the people who are in the current, maybe got displaced during you know, COVID, how do we get them the skills they need? So I think there's a, a strong need to have a real concrete plan because, you know, aside from you know, labor and supply chain and investment, I mean, other than that, everything's fine. But in this particular <laughs> case, labor is the one that we probably can act on, the, I think, the most quickly. And follow up, if you would, on that, Dennis, do you see one party over another having a better as opposed to worse uh, plan to help deal with those labor shortages? No, I think they've all got, they've all they've all articulated the right thing. I think the uh, where, where the 
current government has started and and made some commitments on training. I think it's a it's a great start. And uh, but it, at the end of the day, you know, in Ontario, uh, ma manufacturing and the whole area of the industrial economy is is so important. I don't think any party would 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 not make those investments. You just have to. Okay, I want to raise with both of you now uh, an issue that was not in any of those charts we just showed, and that is electricity, namely a reliable and affordable uh, source of electricity for manufacturers in this province. And we heard some rumors uh, not a week ago about the fact that one of these multi-billion dollar announcements made by both uh, the federal and provincial governments for uh, an EV battery plant uh, for Stellantis in southwestern Ontario was potentially in jeopardy because the company wasn't convinced that we had a reliable source of electricity here in the province going forward uh, a decade, which, of course, they need to see to make this kind of commitment. Uh, Alini, start us off on this. How concerned should manufacturing be that we don't have this affordable and reliable source of electricity in the province anymore? Very, very. It's a cost. Right, electricity is a cost. So uh, part of this strategy to advance and, and ensuring that manufacturing is uh, it's healthy uh, is to ensure that the cost of, of electricity are low. Um, also, uh, facilitate it would be great if all parties could uh, include discussions about how can manufacturers access clean energy as well, clean electricity as well, as we transition to a net zero carbon economy. Dennis, can I get you on that? Uh, yes, I, I, I agree. One of the, the things when you look at the cost of doing business in Ontario, when you talk to manufacturers, you know, versus, for example, Quebec, where hydro is, you know, electricity is much cheaper, and even Manitoba in the other direction, I think there's a real uh, urgent need, and I thought the, uh, the, the comments made by Stellantis, you know, are something that we ought to think about. How do we get us to a position where we maybe are using more nuclear power or using more other clean energies? Because we really do have to make sure that, that on that one cost input, which is after labor tends to be the second biggest. After the cost of labor, it's usually the cost of energy, which is the biggest cost that manufacturers face. So let's make sure uh, we have a long-term plan uh, that is inclusive. And I, you know, I know that there's been a lot of discussion around small modular reactors, for example, as one component. We need to we need to look at everything at this point. Well, let me follow up on that again, because the Pickering nuclear reactors, which are coming up on, I guess, about 60 years old soon, are set to be mothballed, I believe, in a couple of years' time. And one of the first things that the Ford government did when it came into power was cancel a whole bunch of contracts with renewable electricity um, generators. And I wonder, uh, okay, Alini, tell us, in hindsight, how smart a decision was that? That, will, that, will, that is complicated. That will uh, have costs. Uh, and that creates uncertainty. Uncertainty for investors, uncertainty for consumers as well. We don't know. We know it's necessary to achieve our goals, our net zero goals, to uh, heavily invest in net zero, in net zero, sorry, in renewable energy, biofuels, hydrogen, and etc. Um, rolling back sends the wrong signals that Ontario is serious about uh, about these issues, about affordable. Um, and resilient uh, um, energy system. Dennis, on a list of bad decisions, where would you put the one to cancel all those renewable electricity generating uh, contracts? Well, it was the the bad one of the bad parts of that whole program was the cost was very high, and and that was off putting. So the problem was we didn't have a substitute. So if you want to change that. How, what is our what is the alternative? And I think that's something that governments are going to have to wrestle with. We have to have an alternative source. The one thing we haven't talked about as as this transition to EV vehicles goes on, you know, we all know that all of a sudden the demand for electricity is going not just not at the industrial level at the consumer level is going to increase. So we have to be building that capacity, and we need to be building it now. And and we and really hope that the gov any government that comes in says realizes that our needs really need to match our wants in the next uh, next 20 to 30 years. And boy, uh, it, you can't start too soon. Alini, have you come to a conclusion as to which party best understands this net zero transition that involves, of course, electric vehicles and therefore a lot more, possibly a lot more electricity generation capacity that we're going to need to deal with that? 
I think this part is all of these uh, platforms that they put forward, they're very similar. Uh, they are all heavily investing on electric vehicles, developing electric um, charging, electric fuels, uh, vehicles charging uh, infrastructure. Um, but it's important to realize that this is not enough. This will not be enough. So they're all uh, heading towards the same goals, towards the same uh, ideas. Um, but they are all uh, very much limited still. We have to be going beyond just uh, hoping that, uh, you know, manufacturing of electric vehicles is going to uh, place us in a very competitive uh, manufacturing position uh, to be competitive with other, with other jurisdictions as well. And Dennis, I'm not asking you to carry the can for the PC party here, but the reality is the first year they were in power, they ripped up all the charging stations that the previous government had uh, attempted to build, and now they're, you know, they're shoveling money out the door faster than you can imagine in order to attract EV capacity here. Uh, does that demonstrate to you a level of wisdom needed to get this job done? Well, I guess we never we, we never get uh, angry at someone who converts even if it's late. So at the end of the day, they, you know, they've had that conversion on the road to Damascus to really understand uh, that you cannot produce the kind of economic output that we need unless we make these investments, unless we're providing the capital. Not, so not just the demand side, because a lot of governments and a lot of parties talk about what consumer incentives, and those are great. But what we need to make sure is that there are industrial incentives, incentives for people to locate that uh, uh, equipment here, to, to locate lower energy or to put lower energy technologies in place. So let's make sure that we're we're looking at both sides. And uh, uh, you know where it ends up, I, I don't know, but we, we certainly can't compete with our trading partners if we haven't got a low carbon cost effective energy system to support production. Alini, your friend Dennis there just described it as a conversion on the road to Damascus. <laughs> Are you sure this conversion is going to stick? I, 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 I agree with him. I agree with him. I agree that um, we need to really facilitate and pave the road. We need to have a vision. We need to have a vision of the role of manufacturing in this greening economy, in this low carbon transition. Uh, and this vision, it has to be more holistic, has to be more uh, broadly. We have to, uh, it has to inform the kind of policy decisions, the policy framework that we're going to be putting in place to ensure that manufacturing will thrive uh, in this not only thrive, but lead this transition to a greener economy. Yeah, Dennis, one more on this, and that is the current government of Ontario is obviously making a multi-billion dollar bet that EVs are the future. Are you sure it's the right bet? Well, first of all, I think you can't go in Ontario because of our history and because of the size of the transportation sector and all the companies, the thousands of companies that support it, you can't not but invest in that because uh, there is so much dependent on our ability to continue to be part of the the next transportation revolution. You know, we you know 60, 70 years ago we had the auto pack. It made sense. It brought production of cars to Ontario and um, and vehicles to Ontario. And beside it, it brought all the suppliers, the thousands and thousands of suppliers of everything from chemicals to parts to to ingredients that go into uh, that go into those uh, those cars. So if you're going to stay in that game, and Ontario, I think, you know, has made it pretty clear they want to stay in that game, then we need to be making those investments to attract uh, uh, that those large capital. Last time it was internal combustion, now it's electric. So I think uh, there's no, they, I don't think they really have a choice, to be frank. Gotcha. Uh, in our last few minutes here, I just want to, I know you two both have uh, long wish lists of what, you know, in your dreams you'd love to see governments do in order to backstop manufacturing and its growth in the economy. So, Alini, let's get started on, on that. What's on your wish list that you haven't seen fulfilled yet? I wish the conversation about promoting manufacturing would be more place-based in Ontario. Uh, manufacturing, it's a, it's a broad term, it's an umbrella term. We're talking about auto vehicles, biotech, food processing, clean tech, etc. Uh, each of these subsectors require a specific uh, number of skills. We can just go with one size fit all strategy and assume that uh, we're going to meet all of these different needs, different needs that are by sector, that are by uh, regions as well. So we need to have a much more nuanced conversation uh, around how to better 
promote these different sectors to advance them and, 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 and create competitive advantages here in Ontario. Dennis, how about you? Well, one of the things we, we said early on was they need, we talked about this thing called the 2% challenge, which means you really have an industrial strategy that attracts at least 2% of the average OECD investment in, in technology across the broad sector. We said that's about $18 billion a year we'd have to add to the investment in Ontario. And, and Lini's right. And then we need the cascade from that. What are we going to do for each of the sectors? So we really need an industrial strategy at the end of the day. The Conservatives have talked about one, and we look forward to you know, what that looks like, because uh, at this stage, it's a bit piecemeal, and uh, we need to make sure that we have, you know, we want to know where we want to go. Dennis, I've been hearing people from your organization for 40 years say we need an industrial strategy, and, and it doesn't seem to actually happen. Why is that? I, I, well, that's a good question. Steve. I think, and I, and, and look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm aged 40 years, boy. Uh, let me <laughs> tell you. At the end, at, what really is often difficult is they tend to make a lot of governments tend to make a lot of short-term decisions and all the small incremental decisions. I, you know, the Canadian governments often talked about peanut butter and everything. Put a bit everywhere. I think it's time at this stage of our evolution, post-pandemic, and the realization that we need this industrial strategy or an industrial sector uh, that we actually focus. And I think Ontario is in, you know, a like um, like Quebec. Quebec is probably the only other place where it's a large enough sector where you can really focus. So let's hope this time it sticks. Gotcha. Uh, I want to thank both of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views with us. Alini Coutinho from the Smart Prosperity Institute, Dennis Darby from the Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Great to have you both with us and take care the rest of the way. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. Tomorrow, we'll hear from Indigenous candidates from different parties about what issues they're most engaged with. Also, a look at what's being promised in campaign 2022 for the Ring of Fire mining development in Ontario's far northwest. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.